Welcome to Sumo. You should watch Sumo. My name is Andre. I've been paneling here at Fanime for a long time. I've also been a Sumo fan for a very long time. I've been watching now for, it's 2023 now, so I think I've been watching for 15 years. And it's, it's better than ever now in order to actually get into Sumo, which is great because like when I first started, it was very difficult, it was very expensive, it was very inconsistent, and now there's just a wide range of things available. Let me go ahead and get started. All right, so yeah, never been a better time. I just literally repeated the slides. The only different colored slide you're gonna see, thank God. All right, so let's see if it actually loads up. So we're gonna start with about, this is about from September of 2012. I remember this bout. The gentleman on the left here, that's Hakuho. And a gentleman on the right here, that's Harama Fuji. And uh, I'm gonna let the match speak for itself. He's gotten bigger, but he's still considered a small man in sumo. The grunting's done. Now the real thing. Six times they've met on Senshiraku. Hakuho's won four of them, obviously being the Yokozuna with the better numbers. But the last two times they've met on the dojo, it's been Harama Fuji getting psyched up for this. He's 14 and 0. This will be a incredible performance of his Ozeki to go 15 and 0, two tournaments in a row, and it would be his 31st victory in a row. The Hakuho has been a long time for him without a top division championship. He Hakuho certainly... wins. It's a playoff. He certainly doesn't want it. He doesn't certainly doesn't want the tournament to end here. Straight on, Harama Fuji into the Yokozuna. He's in an awkward position. The Yokozuna looks to have the strength here, right hand in. Harama Fuji with no left hand grip. The Yokozuna no left hand as well. Now Harama Fuji goes deep with the left. He's very good at uh, Hineri moves occasionally. But the Yokozuna picks him up, drives him to the edge, digging in as Harama Fuji. No grip with the left of any strength at the moment. He can pull a Dashinage too on, a, on occasions, but I think he nets, needs to drive forward against the much stronger Yokozuna. Chest to chest. The head into the uh, chest by Harama Fuji into Hakuho. Doesn't allow Hakuho to pull a throw with the right from here. But does it become Uchimuso? Does he slap the right hand, left hand, or left leg of tries a leg sweep? I'd be using the hand to knock the knee. Chest to chest once again. Is it going to be Hakuho or Harama Fuji? Left hand in under the armpit by the Yokozuna. Now driving is Harama Fuji. A little lower now. He's in a better position. He can drive from this position. Hakuho's got that. Uh, Angled stance. Leg sweeps could be the order of the day here. If Hakuho seems to be in. This is an incredibly long position. match. They normally I'm never last anywhere near this long. Here. This is for the Yusho. One minute 30 seconds already gone by. No grip from the left hand. There's the arc. Harama Fuji driving against Hakuho. Hakuho digs in at the edge, then gets attempted throw by Harama Fuji. They're both tired, and Harama Fuji drives, but he can't get it done. Now he tries a topping sumo, oh. and it's Harama Fuji's Yusho. Exceptional. Brilliant. So this is widely considered to be one of the best matches of all time. Um, it's a classic match. So the gentleman on the left, as I mentioned, that's Hakuho. He was a Yokozuna at that point, which is the highest rank you can be. And the gentleman on the right, Harama Fuji, he was an Ozeki at this point. This is the match after he won this match and won this tournament, he got promoted up to Yokozuna. So. Uh, it, it was a really important match. This was his 15th win in a row in this tournament. So the guy on the right, Harama Fuji, he won, he won every single match he had in the tournament. So that's 15 matches. But he also had a perfect tournament, the tournament before. So this is actually his 30th win in a row, which is quite remarkable. And he he uh, he got his uh, he got promoted up to Yokozuna. So I. I just figured I want to show a really good match before we jump into some of like the information about sumo because 
this is one of the reasons why to watch sumo. Now, as I mentioned, this is unusual. Most matches last less than 10 seconds. Most matches are incredibly fast, but both of these gentlemen are very highly skilled and really know what they're doing. So, how many of you have ever watched sumo before? Sweet, so we have a bunch of new people. I hope you come and enjoy it. Uh, so, fundamentally, sumo is just a wrestling, grappling martial art. Um, it's unique in amongst a lot of sports in that it has really deep religious ties that have evolved over the years, over the centuries, and arguably even over the millennium, uh, the millennia. Um, so when I refer to sumo, I'm gonna refer to professional sumo, which is anything that takes place basically inside of Japan. And those are all the events run by the Japanese Sumo Association or the Nihon Sumo Kyokai. There is amateur sumo both in the United States, in Japan, and around the world. I'm not really going to talk about those a whole lot, but there are amateur events that take place, um, and there are people who actually make their living doing it because it's um, it can be it can be a good living. It can also be a much more freeing environment than what we'll talk about with what goes on inside of sumo. So, how do you win in sumo? There's really only two ways to win in sumo, short of being disqualified. You either force your opponent to touch any part of their body outside of the ring or you force your opponent to touch the ground with anything other than the bottom of their feet. That's it. Those are all the rules. Uh, well, those are the two ways to win. How do you win? Uh, I mean, so what are the rules? God, I don't know how to speak or read my own stuff today. Um, the rules. Can't strike with a closed fist, so no punching. No kicking. Um, you'll sometimes see people try to do foot sweeps, and Hakuho actually went in for what the guy was like, oh, that's a foot sweep. As somebody who does judo, that's, that's a kick. Um, that, that's what, it's a desperation move, but foot sweeps often look like kicks when you do them at the right timing. That's really the difference between a kick and a foot sweep is your timing. Uh, no groin strikes or grabs, so you can't kick them in the nuts. You can't grab them in the nuts, but you are wearing a mawashi, which is that thing that's going, that basically the belt that's wrapped around you and comes up over the groin. So you can, that you already have a wedgie before you get there, they can actually make it worse. Um, no eye pokes and no finger bending. Uh, no choking. You can actually put a uh, arm. You can't put your hand up against and grip up against somebody's throat. That's not considered a choke um, because you're not actually. You're just attacking the windpipe and you're not really. You're not really doing strangulation. No double ear clapping. So you can whack somebody on the side of the head if you think of like sumo. If you think of like e Honda from Street Fighter, you can do that, but you can only do one side at a time. You can't do both at the same time. And then lastly, no hair, no hair pulling. So collectively, these are known as kinjite, or forbidden techniques. Now, out of all of these, the only one you really ever see is the hair pulling. And even that's not that common. Um, but I do have a video that actually goes over that later on that demonstrates a whole bunch of really cool kind of things. So let's give a real high level overview. So since the 1960s, there are six official tournaments that happen every year. So there's one going on right now. They take place in every odd numbered month. So right now, the one taking place, the May uh, Basho or the May tournament, is taking place in Tokyo right now. Um, let's see, it's seven in the morning, so a little bit later today, probably around six or seven o'clock our time, the matches will actually start. The matches take place throughout the entirety of the day. So there are three tournaments that take place in Tokyo. The other three take place in Osaka, Nagoya, and Fukuoka in that order. So the March tournament takes place in Osaka. The, the September tournament takes place in Fuku, no, no, the November tournament takes place in Fukuoka. And then the one that's gonna happen in July takes place in Nagoya. So each tournament lasts 15 days. Now we'll talk about the divisions a little bit later, but the people who are in the top two divisions fight all 15 days. So if you're a professional uh, wrestler and you make it up to Sekitori rank, or to the Sekitori ranks, you're actually fighting, uh, you're fighting 90 days out of the year. That's, that's a lot, that's a lot for any professional sport, and there's a lot of buildup that takes place before you get to fight. Um, and there are events that actually take place in between. So there are exhibition tournaments that take place. So the life of a, of a, of a sumo wrestler or of a rikishi is actually a really hard one in that you're constantly on the go, you're constantly training, you're constantly traveling. And as I discuss a little bit later, sumo really is sort of a way of life once you go into it. Now everybody who's not at secretary status fights only seven days. 
So they basically either fight the first half of the tournament or they fight at the second half of the tournament. Um, there are six divisions. Each division has its own champion. I know, it's exciting. Um, each division has its own champion. There are no ties allowed, so they do have playoffs if there's a tie based upon the number of wins. And the most convoluted ones you can see that you most commonly see is maybe a three-way tie. They do have rules for four-way and up ties, which is ridiculous, um, but that doesn't happen very often. Fundamentally, sumo is all about winning. So if you win more, win, if you, you want to win more times than you lose. So if you win more than you lose, you get promoted. If you lose more than you win, you get demoted. And fundamentally, it pays to be a winner. So let's go over some basic vocabulary. Um, when we talk about a wrestler, the term that's most commonly used is rikishi. That literally means strong man. There's an older term called sumo tori. It's not as used as often. Most of the time you hear people either call them a sumo wrestler or a rikishi. Uh, oyakatas are stable masters and coaches. Every sumo wrestler who joins and basically has to join a heya, or basically a place where they train, or a stable as it's most commonly referred to um, in English. Um, and their oyakata is basically their coach or the stable master. Uh, Gyoji is the referee who stands in the middle. It's the gentleman who was wearing the very flashy outfit and had a little war fan. Um, Shimpan are judges. There's five judges around the outside, um, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. The Yobidashi are the guys that usher people around. They also get on to the, state, to the, to the ring or to the dokyo and sing out the names of all the wrestlers whenever they're going out there to wrestle. Um, each technique, there are 72 recognized techniques in sumo. They're called kimarite. Um, most of them you'll never ever hear, you'll never ever see because they're really, no, nobody does them anymore. There's no good reason for them. Um, a kachikoshi is a winning record. A makikoshi is a losing record. Um, a monoi is basically when there's a judge conference. If something goes wrong or if they think there's a wrong call or something else, they'll have a monoi. A kujo is a absence or withdrawal from a tournament. So wrestlers have to compete. They don't get breaks. Um, if you don't show up, it's marked as losses and you will end up being demoted. So this doesn't matter if you're injured or not. It doesn't matter if you got knocked out. Um, the only exception to this has been either very recently for Yokozuna or it's been for if you tested positive for COVID, you actually wouldn't be relegated. But that's the first time in you know, more than 100 years that there's been any kind of exception for it. The Banzuke is just the ranking order, so each tournament at the end of it, um, there's a deliberation that takes place and they figure out who's getting promoted and who's getting demoted and how they're going to be ranked. And then lastly, as I mentioned, the Heya is the stable at which all the Rikishi train. So when somebody steps onto the stage, they announce which stable they belong to, what their home uh, prefecture is, if you're Japanese, or your home country, if you're a foreigner. So, you know, who your hey is actually pretty important. Gyoji, that's a really colorful outfit. So, Gyoji are one of the professions you can have if you want to be in professional sumo. So, really, you can be a wrestler, you can be a ref you can be a you can be a you can be a referee or you can be a yobidashi. Those are really the only three things you can do if you want to be in professional sumo. There are like the people who work the convenience stands at other places, but really there's only three jobs you can be in you want to be in, in uh, sumo. Gyoji start at a very young age. You know, if you're not big enough to be a sumo wrestler, a lot of kids who are interested in sumo but simply aren't built for sumo, a number of them go up to become gyoji and they become judges. So the main responsibility of the judge is to call the match. The interesting thing, when there's a really close call, if it's not really clear who has won or who has lost, the gyoji is still obligated to make a call. Doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. It doesn't matter if you, if the gyoji has been knocked off of the dohyo, which happens more often than you might think, and they weren't possibly able to see the match, they have to call in one direction or the other. And that usually leads to a mono e or a discussion about who actually won or not. Now these guys actually work their way up through the ranks. Each one is assigned or belongs to a particular heya, and they grind through it for their entire lives. Every profession in sumo has a hard retirement age of 65. You have to be able to do the job effectively, but this is largely, your ranking is largely based upon longevity. So you outlast everybody else when somebody else retires, either of their own volition or because of some scandal or because of injury, that's how you get promoted. And you'll notice that that's the way a lot of things work actually 
inside a sumo outside of the actual wrestlers. He's holding an item in his right hand that's called the, um, oh my god, that's called the Goombai. I almost forgot it. I almost forgot it. So this actually hails back to an older time in Japan. This is what's known as a war fan. So back during combat, one of the common ways for commanders to communicate orders is to use flags. Or they use war fans like this. This is a common kind of war fan that's used, it's easily visible. And in this case, he's actually, he's done what we call, like if the fan is facing towards you, we call it Goombai Dori, which means it's time for the match to start. And everything that they do is all based around ceremonies that you could go into the deeper meanings of it, but fundamentally it's tradition. This is why something is the way it is, and sumo is all about tradition. The longer you last, the higher rank you get, the nicer your kimono usually ends up being. When they're very young, it's much smaller, it's, it's shorter, you can actually see their legs. They only wear sandals. Once you advance, you can actually wear socks and sandals, because I guess that's a perk. They can also have official supporters. Gyoji can actually have support clubs, so people can sign up and join and donate money and to help buy them like a new, really fancy, kimono or something like that. Interestingly, and the last thing we'll talk about with gyoji is that they all have their birth names, but every gyoji actually has a name that's assigned to them based upon their rank. So as somebody advances or gets promoted as time goes by in sumo, their name changes. And so it becomes a little bit confusing, but the guy at the top always has the exact same name. As to why that is, I mean, if I gave you a reason other than tradition, it's really not a good reason other than it's just tradition. Shinpan, so these are the judges. So there's five of them sitting around the ring and this is actually them inside of the ring. So all of these are former wrestlers. So after somebody retires from being a wrestler, this is one of the avenues available as future employment, but only if you were able to make it up into the higher ranks of sumo. So these basically sit around as five judges. They are there to watch the match. They help tally the official scores for the match to make sure of it. Um, one of them is the official timekeeper. So he actually keeps track of how much time is being spent when they're doing their stare-offs at the beginning. Um, and that one is probably one of the most important ones because he's communicating directly with the television producer to know how much time is left, especially if they need to drag things out because all the matches were done super early, but they still got 20 minutes of air to fill. They are actually responsible for helping to fill that air time. This is an example of if something happened or the, somebody saw something and disagrees with the referee or they just want to double check. This is called a monoi. It's literally a discussion about things, if you want to transliterate it. The five of them will get up there and they will talk about what they see. They also will talk to a video replay booth that actually has another couple of judges who have access to all of the cameras and all of the footage that takes place. It's really kind of super interesting. Now, Japan is a country that loves tradition. Sumo is hyper fixated with, with uh, tradition. But sumo has had video replay in it since the 1960s, since 1969, which is longer than any Western sport. And that specifically happened because there was a massive scandal where a winning streak was broken by a bad call. And what happened is, is there was a very clear, there was very clear video footage that the call had, been gone, had gone the wrong way. And the next day in the newspaper, the front, for, front page was a picture of the other guy having stepped out already, but he ended up being called as winning the match. So after that, they had put together video replay. And so video replay is used whenever there's any real doubt or whenever there's any confusion. So let's talk about divisions. So there's six divisions. Now, if you watch sumo on, on TV, if you watch it from the NHK, you're really only watching the top division, which is called maku uchi or maku no uchi. Um, just, they're the exact same word, except the word no is put in between the two main uh, words. That's set, that one is set with 40, no more than 42 wrestlers in it at any given time. And the division below it is judo. Now, this is what you will see most of the time. These are all, this is what we call the sekitori that I mentioned previously. All of these people have a salary. The lowest salary, I think, for, a seki, for a, somebody in judo is $9,000 a month, which is not bad, actually. But anybody who's in any of these lower brackets, any of these lower divisions, is paid a small pittance per tournament. They might get $200 per tournament, if that. 
Most of the wrestlers exist in these bottom four. The top division represents maybe 10 to 15% of all wrestlers in sumo. So for most people, they just have a really rough life, but that's what they want to do. The sekitori are broken up into these top ranks. So you have from top down, you have Yokozuna, then you have Ozeki, Sekiwake, Komusubi, Maegashira, and Juryo. Um, these all have specific meanings to them. Now, most people have heard the phrase Yokozuna at some point. How many people remember the wrestler from WWF, Yokozuna, back in the day? So they basically took a name and named it, they, they basically took a name of a rank and assigned it to a wrestler. There's also been a more recent wrestler whose name was just Rikishi, who was famous for slamming his butt into people's faces. Um, that was like his special technique or something. I don't know why it was a special technique, but it's WWF and it was the early 2000s. What do you want? These are all different ranks. Each rank comes with its own perks, and we're going to talk a little bit about each of them a little bit later. So let's talk about timelines of a match. So think back to that video you watched. Fundamentally, there's all these steps that take place, and this takes place from the lowest level all the way up to the highest level. The main difference is the amount of time that the wrestlers are given in order to do each of their things. So fundamentally, this little diagram actually shows all the people. So these are the Yobidashi guys. You'll see them. They're sitting around here. They have this bucket of water that they're maintaining. This is also a little thing filled with salt. So basically, the senior most, uh, senior most Yobidashi steps up onto the empty dohyo, or the empty ring, and sings out the names of each of the wrestlers. Now, this goes back to the days when there was no television, there were no microphones. People would show up to matches and didn't know who was fighting. So the Yobidashi would get up there and shout out the names of it. And over time, it evolved into sort of this sing-song kind of style shouting. So they really draw out the syllables. Um, it's really fun to watch them draw out the syllables of somebody who has maybe seven or eight syllables in their name or only have two in their name. So it's, it's kind of fun to watch. It's this nice little bit of things. So after they do their announcement, the Rikishi step up onto the dohyo and they bow to each other. You know, they always have to be respectful. They stare off at each other. You'll see them do all sorts of moves, like they'll put their hands out. That's to show that they have no weapons. They might do a couple of leg stamps. They might do what we call shiki, which is you'll see them sometimes take their leg and put it all the way up and then stamp it down. Um, it's supposed to intimidate the other person. Real in reality, it's just to kill time and it's to show off that you're not scared of the other person. They then step back to the corner, and from that bucket of water, they actually get some water. Um, this was suspended during COVID. Not the motions, just the water. So there's this little scoop of water that is given to them. Um, whichever, whoever won the previous match, that wrestler sticks around and actually hand, offers the water to that wrestler. And on the other side, it's maybe the wrestler hasn't gone yet. So basically, it's either somebody who has won or fundamentally somebody who doesn't have the stink of a loss on them. So they are handed the water of power, or jikaramisu, um, and they take a sip. They're supposed to rinse out their mouth, and then they spit it out. During COVID, there was nobody in the audience. Um, everybody was, uh, uh, everybody like, was just doing this in isolation. Um, but they still did everything, there was just no water. So they would go, they would take the thing, they would do this, and then they would fake spit and all of this other stuff. It was, it was a great little bit of theater. Um, next big thing, there are these little things of salt right here. This diagram actually shows it, which is really kind of nice. One of the more spectacular things that some wrestlers do is they will grab big heaping handfuls of salt and just chuck them up in the air. And it's this wonderful little rainbow you'll see of, of, of salt flying through the air. Um, most others just grab a little bit and toss it. It's supposed to purify everything. Salt is big about purification in a lot of Japanese uh, ceremonies and religion. So they go and they repeat this process two or three times. They'll go into the center. They'll stare each other down. They'll look at each other. They'll go back to their corner. They only get the water once, but they can stare down. They can get a little cloth. They can wipe themselves down with some sweat. They can wipe off the sand from their, the salt from their hands. Then they grab another handful of sand, toss it in there, go in there. And they do that over and over until the referee indicates to them that time is up. Now, strictly speaking, every single time they face off, they can start the match. The wrestlers are allowed to start the match whenever both of them agree to start the match. It's done wordlessly. Now, 
I've been watching for 15 years, I've seen this happen once. It's called Jukan Mae. And it's a surprising to everybody whenever it happens. Because like the cameraman's not ready, the referee has to be ready, but the referee doesn't think it's going to happen. Um, but it technically can happen. But ultimately, if they go back and forth and they haven't settled on when they're gonna start, basically the referee steps forward, goes into a forward-facing stance and tells them time is up, let's get it on. You gotta go fight. So they, the requirements are they both are supposed to put their fists down, both fists are supposed to touch the, the, the ground, and then they attack each other. Now, you'll sometimes see what we call a mata, where one person is clearly out of sync with the other one, and they may have to go back and reset. And if things go really wrong, you'll see, you'll see several mata, and then the chief uh, judge, or this guy here, will start to yell at them, basically, of like, come on, guys, get, 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 get your act together, do this. So they put their fists down, they charge at each other, and then there's a winner. Uh, mo like I said, most matches actually last, you know, maybe 10 seconds, if, if that. Um, I'm sure you could get, find like an actual average, but I don't think I'd be very far off from there. As I mentioned, the referee has to actually say somebody was a winner. Now, if there's any question or if it's not clear, they can have the mono e, as I mentioned. Um, and there are a couple of outcomes from that. Either the referees uphold it, they say, yep, the referee, the, the judges say they uphold it, and they say, yep, you were correct, we award the match. Um, the referee got it wrong, the other person very clearly won, we reverse the decision and the other person wins, or they say, you know what, it was too close to call, rematch. Those are really the only three outcomes that are possible. This is another clip, this is a voice over clip, unfortunately, because it's very hard to keep sumo videos on YouTube because they're constantly taken down for copyright reasons. But this is actually a very long and interesting match that's going to talk about several of the topics I just mentioned. So there's gonna be a discussion that takes place. Um, you're gonna see some of the stuff that stand, when they stand off and look at each other. Um, I hope you enjoy it. So if you watch on NHK, this is one of the things you'll see very often um, if you're watching the Japanese language with the, if you're watching the, the Japanese feed with the English overdub, because NHK actually has English, official English announcers who dub on a secondary audio channel. So on the left here, it actually shows the last, so this is fundamentally between these two people. So this is, this is uh, Kakuryu here on the left, who's a Yokozuna. And the person here on the right, this is Goedo, who's an Ozeki. These are the results of the last six matches that they've won, the, the last six matches that they've had. So you can see that Kakuryu has won five of the last six matches that these two have fought with each other and has a record of 16 and eight in their overall career at the higher divisions. This is in Japanese. This is actually telling you what the specific technique was so you can see what it is. Questions? All right, so, pause, so the space bar is not pause and resume, it's restart. Well, thank you for being consistent, Google. Um, actually, I'll go back to this and show this. So this is their names and their kanji. So this is Kakuryu, this is Goedo. This is actually telling you what their record is right now in Japanese. So this is eight wins with three losses. So that actually tells you which day we're on. We're on day 12 because there have been 11 matches before. Goedo has a record of, five, of six and five. And then this is their rank up here, Ozeki and uh, Yokozuna. Now, this tells you that Goedo is actually from Osaka. He's from the Osaka area. But this over here tells you that Kakuryu, that says Mongol. That means he's a Mongol. Um, he is, he's been part of the dominant Mongolian wave in Suma. We'll talk a bit about that a little bit later. And at the bottom here, this tells you finally uh, what, uh, what Heia they belong to. So let's start this up. And that man there is Kakuru, the new Shin Yokozuna. Shin means new in this context in Japanese. Yeah, this is from a guy's YouTube channel that got taken down like three or four times. So that's why you'll, you'll hear him. He's not going to be very happy with, that, with some of the stuff that happens. I actually personally love it. Fighting Guido, the perennial Sekiwake. <laughs> and uh, I can't imagine him, uh, you know, 
changing that status unless he... So this is one of the stare-offs that they do. Now, like I said, they could actually start fighting now, but this is like one of the last fights of the day. They never go before their time is up, partially because they know that they want to make sure they use all the TV time available because that's expected of them. Um, this is one of the Yobidashi up here. You'll see him, he's actually sweeping everything. He clearly doesn't think anything's going to happen early because if it does happen early, he has to just jump off of the Dokyo and get out of the way because they are not going to get out of the way of him. Uh, the other fun fact, you can see these are the, here on the left you can see very clearly, that's the bucket. That's the bucket that has the water in it. If somebody's falling off of there, one of their jobs is actually to get the bucket out of the way so the guy doesn't hit the bucket. Um, but they almost always take out the little salt mound, so you can see like a little explosion of salt as somebody lands over there. It's actually very amusing to watch. Like I said, you know, wind's here and wind's some more over the week. We shall see. My guess There's is a salt get, throw? they'll get eight or nine winds. Stay at okay, I want that guy to shut up now. I'm tired of listening to him. On the other hand, already at eight and three. Okay, let's see. Where are we? Okay, so. As I mentioned, so the referee has actually stepped forward. He has his gun by facing forward, which is saying, time is up. It's time to get it on. Um, the shimpan back here, actually, the guy, the judge who's sitting back here, that's actually the timekeeper. So if the cameraman's actually generous and you're able to see it, you can actually see that he'll, he'll indicate to the referee it's time to fight. Um, if you know how to look for it and if the cameraman puts it in the frame. Beat some high-powered opponents in the next few days. Here we go, final match. So the referee has called the match. He's called the match in Goedo's favor. And the Zabutons start flying. So this, this is a fun little thing. Um, sorry? Oh, <laughs> some people actually know what that means. So Zabuton are just cushions. So there's a tradition in sumo that if somebody who was of lower rank defeats a Yokozuna or somebody who's very high ranked, all of the spectators, or a good number of them, will just take their cushions and fling them down there. And if you understand Japanese, you can listen to the in-house speaker playing like, please stop throwing your cushions. Please stop throwing your cushions. Oh my god, just please stop throwing your cushions. Over and over and over again. And the Yobidashi are all freaking out and come running in, try to grab as many of them as they can. I wouldn't throw my Zabuton because if there's other matches, now you just have to sit on the floor. But like, it's great if it's at the end of the day you want to sell. Exactly. That's the exact kind of excitement I enjoy. So what's interesting here is you can barely sort of see it in a shot because, you know, this is rendered at potato quality. But there are, in addition to the referee who's sitting over here, there's actually the next sumo wrestler. In fact, there's usually two sumo wrestlers. It depends on exactly where they are. Now, any one of the judges can say, hey, let's take a look by raising their hand. But by the rules, actually, any wrestler who's sitting by the side can also say, hey, I think you folks need to take another look. They are not invited up for the mono-e, but they can trigger a mono-e. So Hakuho here, who you saw earlier, actually has his hand up. <laughs> so he raised his hand, and so now all the judges have to get up. Oh, a mono-e? The Zabuton flying is one of the best things ever. Especially if it whacks the judge. Most of the judges are in their like, late 50s or early 60s. And I always love these women who are like, Oh no, don't hit me with a cushion! <laughs> yeah, you can't see it from there. So, take a look at the replay here. Oh! 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 Now, even on the way down, is that after the effect? Or is this a small time soaker? Half of the fun of sumo is watching people fall off of the thing in Guilty slow motion. That it happened. And he's called everybody back, not to be bombarded by So he's the one who raised his hand. He's at this point he's been a Yokozuna for a while. This is two years after the match we watched. Well, we need another replay. And they're all chatting. But they're talking to the they're talking to the replay people. Now what's interesting 
is actually, when they go to the video replay, the video replay people actually have final authority. They can say, you know what, I understand the people down there, you may not agree with it, but we're literally looking at the replay because the judges who are standing there, they don't have a television set, they didn't wheel out a TV for them to watch it. So somebody in the back says, you know what, this is what it is, you have to call it that way. So the video room actually has final ultimate authority. So he grabbed that man's top knot at a certain stage. All right. And he's hanging out of it, he's not got the top knot there. Got the neck, doesn't have it there. Falling, he grabs it there. And you can't see it from that angle. Look like no. The other angle shows it pretty no. clearly. From that they, angle, no. Yeah, if they can see... Possible. They can see that replay. They shouldn't shouldn't reverse it. Yeah, this guy's wrong. That slow motion camera is. Yeah, the impression that there was no grabbing at the top knot. It was more a handle. And what's funny is it takes them forever to get up and get back down because they're seated there usually for so long, and they're also sitting on these giant pillows. So like it's a whole ordeal. What? So yeah, basically he said Gyoji Gumbai uh, such a guy. So he they overturned it, um, and he's gonna award it the other way. And the guy who got his hair pulled because it doesn't really matter what's happened if you've done any legal action. Too bad, so sad, you lose. Um, we'll, you'll get to see a few other cool little things. So the referee is watching, walking over right now. This, again, this is potato quality. Um, but he's actually got a fat stack of bills. So we'll talk about that a little later, but there's literally prize money you're given if you win, and the referee is the one responsible for giving it to you. Um, so yeah, he walks over, hands it to him. He does a little thing with his hands. And he's got like a nice little stack there. From what I remember, it was like maybe 10 or 15 envelopes, and each one of them has about 300 bucks in it. So it literally pays to be a winner. So it's a great video that shows an example of a match that happens. It's not a bad match. It's not a stellar match, but shows you what happens when somebody says, hey, I think there's something wrong, and they go back to video, and they, they figure out that it was actually the other side should have won. Continuing on, let's talk a little bit about uh, the sort of styles and techniques of sumo. The, broadly speaking, there's kind of two styles. Um, in English, we'll call them push or thrusters, or we'll call them grapplers. Um, most yokozuna fall into the latter camp, which is belt or mawashi, or yotsuzumo uh, wrestlers. So fundamentally, they're trying to grab the other person's belt and then use a technique to flip them over, or push them out, anything like that. Um, the name actually refers to the four ways of grabbing their mawashi. So if you think if you're facing off against somebody, you can either have one hand inside and one hand on the outside, meaning you're inside their armpit on one side, you're on the outside of their arm on the other, and you're grabbing. So you have your left side, you have your right side. You can also have both, you can have both of your arms inside and grab them, or you can have both hands on the outside and grab them. So that's where the term yotsu zumo comes from. Um, or you can have pusher thrusters, which is kind of what you think when you see E. Honda from Street Fighter, is he's not trying to grab the other person, he's just trying to slap them. Now, I played enough Street Fighter to know that like, that's not actually what E. Honda does, but people who are at the high level actually usually can translate from one to the other. Um, people who are just pusher thrusters tend to not actually make it super high in sumo because they're really limiting their techniques and a lot of their opponents are very highly skilled. So in general, you need to have some of them, but you can go very far. There have been a few. Um, there's another video I'm gonna show a little bit later that actually has somebody in there. But sadly, you're not gonna to get to see any of these pushing thrusting action because of what's gonna to happen to them. So actually, I have the video right here. So let's talk about Henka. Okay, so on the left here, um, you've got this guy. This is Koto Shogiku. He retired not too long ago, um, but he was a perpetual Ozeki or very high ranker um, who just never made it to being a Yokozuna. And then once he sort of got injured enough times, he just kind of never was able to recover. And then this guy over here, well, we'll talk about him later because he is now currently a Yokozuna. So let's play. Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> I like that somebody in the audience is actually like, oh, at the exact same point. So yeah, let's just watch that uh, again. <laughs> Alright, so henka is the phrase that is basic, henka is basically is the term used for when somebody refuses to do the clash, when they refuse to do the tachiyat. Now, this is, this is going to be the spiciest of hot takes for people who are diehard, silly sumo people. So henkas are considered to be really bad sumo by people who are fierce traditionalists. Those people are idiots. Because sumo is a perfectly, the henkas are a perfectly valid way of dealing with people who are very big and you know are going to come right at you. If somebody's going to barrel right into you, why not step off to the side? And if you are somebody who's known for barreling forward, maybe you should keep your feet underneath your shoulders so that you're not overextended. It's a perfectly valid technique. It is not banned. Now, if you are a yokozuna, it is frowned upon, but like, so what? You can do what you want. You, you might get a talking to, but who really cares? So henka are a very sort of controversial thing in sumo of how good or how bad of sumo it is. Um, but as somebody who enjoys the sport and who thinks that you should do whatever you can in order to win, I personally love it. So yeah, by the way, what makes this particularly horrible for this, for this specific match. Oh, hey, no, go back, go back. So Koto Shogiku here on the right. So he was at this point, he was no longer in Ozeki. He had actually been demoted the tournament before. Now we'll talk about it a little bit in Ozeki land, but I'll mention it here first. If you have been, if you were Ozeki and you've been demoted, you go down to the next lower rank, which is Sekiwake. If you win 10 matches in your next tournament, the very next tournament after being demoted, you're automatically promoted back up to Ozeki. So you get like a nice little fail safe in order to get back promoted back up. At this point in the tournament, he had already lost uh, five matches. So he had to win every single match in order to get to 10. So he had this match and then another match. This was on day 14. So by doing this henka on him, he got his sixth loss and he was relegated and he never made it back to Ozeki rank. So that's why a lot of people in this match in particular have a lot of animosity versus this guy. Um, but they can get over it. So sumo, sumo's not like other sports because it's an entire lifestyle. So you enter it at a certain point, you're required to be um, a minimum height and weight. You have to be no older than 25, but most of them enter it, unless they're coming from a collegiate level, they enter it somewhere between the ninth and 12th grade. Because in Japan, you only have nine years of compulsory education. You're not required to do as many years as we have here. Unless you are a champion in college, and I mean a champion, there's collegiate sumo, but if you win some of the most prestigious tournaments, you start at the very, very bottom, and you have to grind your way all the way up. You, that means what you have to do when you live at the Heia, which is your stable, is you literally live there. That's your residence. You don't go home to see your family unless you get permission to go there. You live and sleep and eat and clean and do everything there. You start at the bottom, it means you get up the earliest. You might be getting up at five or six in the morning in order to clean the place, in order to get things going. Higher ranks get to wake up later. Um, the lower ranks are expected to cook all the food and they have to wait for the higher ranks to eat their fill before they get their option to eat. The clothing you wear is determined by your rank. So at the lowest levels, you get to wear classic uh, thin as heck Yukata, and you actually have to wear Geta. If none of you, you've probably seen Geta in anime even if you don't know it by that name. Those are the wooden sandals that are elevated. I've owned Geta. You don't want to walk around in Geta. They're not comfortable. It's a flat plank of, bo of, of wood that is elevated on two other little planks. It's extremely difficult. You have to wear this even in winter. And like, if you've ever been to winter in Japan, it's, it's pretty cold. For Californians like me, the winters there try to kill us. We, we are not built for it. They have to live in that. And ultimately, you have to find, like if you want to join, you have to find a Heia that'll take you. Most Heia don't have a secretary wrestler. They don't have somebody in the top two divisions. It's mostly just lower level guys and you're constantly trying to figure out how to break into it. Interestingly, 
um, ever since I think the late 90s or early 2000s, the, uh, there's been a rule in place that each heya is only allowed to have one foreigner or one non-Japanese born wrestler. And that's because the foreigners basically took over. The last, with the exception of, you know, Kisuno Sato who got promoted very recently, well, in the last five years, and he didn't last very long, unfortunately. Six of the last seven Yokozuna have all been from another country. One was from American Samoa, I think he was from American Samoa, and the rest have all been from Mongolia. The Mongolians have really actually taken over. They're, they're outstanding. So it pays to be a winner. As I mentioned, only secretary get a salary. Everybody else gets a very small allowance. So yeah, you may not get a lot of cash, but if you're a wrestler, you don't have to worry about where your next meal is coming from. You don't have to worry about where you're living, but you're living basically in a college dorm room filled with a bunch of other overweight, struggling wrestlers having to get up early and do stuff. Sekitori are the only ones who are allowed to go out at night and allowed to get married. You have to get permission in order to get married until you get up to a very high level and wear nice clothing. They also get, um, if you're a Sekitori, you also get suke bito, which is basically you get an attendant, lower rank rikishi who follow you around, you might get, they might get to go out with you if you're going out and having some beers with some fans who want to support you or whatever else. They help um, carry items, they help clean them. Hygiene is a non-trivial problem when you're significantly overweight. I will let you figure out exactly what that means, but they have to help them clean themselves because that's just the way it works. Matches can be sponsored, so as I mentioned, there are sponsors who sponsor individual matches. Now there are specific requirements and the way it works is early on before the match starts, when they first step up onto the mat or onto the dojo, the Yobirashi actually carry around these gigantic banners of each one of their sponsors and they walk around. To be a sponsor, you have to agree to a minimum number of sponsorships you do per tournament. So it's not cheap, it's not inexpensive at all. Each one of those banners represents a certain number of envelopes that you get. For really high profile matches, there are gonna be 50 envelopes. Now each one, each one costs about 70,000 yen. So about 60,000 yen is in each envelope. Do the math on that. You can make a nice good 10, 15K for winning a single match. And that's what the Yokozuna are often getting into them. The way it actually works, though, is that half of it is actually set aside by the Sumo, by the sumo Association for retirement because they want to avoid bad things happening to uh, sumo wrestlers when they retire. Sekitori also often have fan clubs and sponsors, so they will go and they will take them out. They will take them out for dinner. They'll take them out drinking. They'll do all sorts of things. One interesting note, sumo wrestlers are not allowed to drive. They are not allowed to drive themselves. There have been a number of high profile incidents that happened in the late 90s, early 2000s, including some accidents and people getting injured. So they basically set the rule that wrestlers are not allowed to drive themselves. Getting to the top. Um, so Sekiwake, Sekiwake is the third highest rank. And that's the highest rank you can achieve with just a simple winning record. So if you're able to grind it out, you win eight matches and lose seven matches endlessly you can actually get all the way up to Sekiwake. In general, if you want to make it up to Ozeki, you have to do a little bit more. So there's an unspoken requirement because Japan is all about unspoken requirements. On average, you need to win about 33 uh, wins over three tournaments at high rank. So you, you can't win 33 matches over three tournaments at the lower ranks and expect to be promoted up there. As you're at the higher levels, you're fighting people who are at higher levels. You're usually ranked up against people who are comparable in rank to you. So that's what you're constantly doing. They also want you to be winning some matches against other high-level people, and they want you to have one or two wins against other against Yokozuna or Ozeki, because it demonstrates that you're actually at a very high level. Now, the nice thing about being an Ozeki is that once you get up there, you have a little bit of a safety net. You can lose one tournament, and you won't be demoted. You'll be put in what we call Kadoban status. And if you have a winning record while in Kadoban status, your Kadoban status goes away and you end up being back to normal. In order to be demoted from Ozeki, you have to lose two entire tournaments in a row. You have to have two losing records in a row, which is not that common. It also means that people who have phenomenal runs often waffle back and forth between being in Kadoban status and not being in Kadoban status. They'll waffle back and forth. It's really unfortunate. The gentleman who, had, who pulled um, Kakoryu's hair, Goedo, he was sort of famous for being a Kadoban Ozeki who just constantly was on the verge of being demoted. It's very sort of unfortunate. Also, as I mentioned, 
what happened to that other gentleman is if you are if you've been demoted from Oseki, you will never be demoted lower than um, Sekiwake. But if you get ten tournament, if you win ten, if you get ten wins in the very next tournament, you'll be promoted back up. Oh, this has only happened six times since this rule was implemented back in 1969. Not super common. Very, very rare. Coming in Yokozuna is even more difficult. There aren't specific itemized requirements, but in general, you need to be getting constant double-digit wins at Oseki status, and you need to win at least one tournament. There is a famous case of a gentleman who was promoted up to being a Yokozuna without winning a single tournament, and then went on to be one of the worst Yokozuna that's ever happened. He was never really able to win. He never really got it together. And so the unspoken rules were amended to say you have to win at least one. There is actually a Yokozuna Deliberation Council that deliberates after each tournament decides who should be promoted to Yokozuna. If anyone, they also handle the promotions of Ozeki and they handle a few other things. This is made up of members of the uh, National Sumo Association. It's also made up of lay people, but in practice it's just mostly high-level sports officials and things like that. Mostly old men. They just, they're the ones that make all the decisions. As I mentioned, six of the last Yokozuna have been foreign-born. So Kisa Nosato was the most recent one. He was promoted, I want to say, like somewhere in 2016, 17-ish, after being an Ozeki for caught for as long as I could possibly remember. And unfortunately, he got injured not too long after and really wasn't able to enjoy his time being a Yokozuna. It was, it was very unfortunate. But he broke the spell because Japan had a period of more than 10 years where there hadn't been a Japanese Yokozuna. It was viewed as a big national sort of sadness. Here's the thing with being Yokozuna. Once you're promoted, you cannot be demoted. But that means if you're not able to deliver, if you're not able to consistently deliver wins, people will start saying you need to retire. And that's, that's it. So imagine if, uh, I mean, the closest equivalent would be, you know, if after Tom Brady won a few Super Bowls, he didn't win a Super Bowl the next year, people would be like, he needs to retire. And it wouldn't be like just press or other stuff. Imagine if it were like owners of teams and, and officials coming down and saying stuff like that. So it, it's really rough once you get up to the top. It's very windy at the top is the best way I've heard it explained, is that when you get to the top of the mountain, it's very windy and you either deliver or you don't. Now, there's been some interesting changes that have happened recently because of uh, a sumo wrestler. Um, so, Kisa Nosato, as mentioned, he got promoted to uh, Yokozuna, and in the very next tournament, I think his second tournament, or his first, yeah, his second tournament as a Yokozuna, he got injured, and he basically sat out eight tournaments. So he created, like, nobody really wanted to talk about it because it was the first Japanese Yokozuna they'd had in such a long time. But in reality, other Yokozuna, when they've gotten injured, they've said, you know, you sit out two tournaments, you need to retire, and that's what's happened. Kisa Nosato has now de facto created an unspoken understanding that Yokozuna can go and sit out up to eight tournaments to deal with injury and not worry about being demoted. Um, Hakuho, who recently retired, he actually did the exact same thing. Although, in his case, I personally believe he was waiting to do, some, to do a ceremony in the, the Olympics because he was still competing in 2020. And then when they got delayed, he basically just sort of sat out. And then when the, when the Olympics actually came, they didn't have a sumo ceremony, which was unusual. Most people think that it was because there's some bad blood between uh, Hakuho and the main members of a sumo association. Teru no Fuji. So this was the gentleman who delivered the uh, henka I talked about, we saw earlier. So he's the only Yokozuna we have right now. He's the 73rd in what we call the modern era of sumo. There are older records, but like sumo was barely an organized sport back in the day. It was mostly just getting big, strong, fat guys to get up and wrestle wherever you went. <laughs> so he has a very interesting story. So he's from Mongolia. Um, he was an Ozeki, and then he got injured so badly that he had to have surgery, and he basically sat out for two years. So he fell all the way to the bottom of the ranking chart. He fell down as far as you can possibly fall um, while he recovered. And then he crawled his way all the way back up to become Yokozuna. It's, it's pretty remarkable. There's another gentleman who recently um, retired. His name is Tochinoshin. He actually did the same thing, but only to Ozeki status. 
So he was an Ozeki, he got very injured, he fell all the way to the bottom and he clawed his way back up and managed to make it to Ozeki. He just never made it to uh, Yokozuna. And he just, he just recently retired. So Teru no Fuji is the only Yokozuna we have. He's missed quite a few tournaments because he has ongoing problems with his knees. You can't see it from this picture very obviously, but his knees, whenever you see him in combat, he has massive knee braces on. His knees are destroyed, and sumo's obviously very hard on the body, and it will destroy your knees. Life is hard for losers. If you're demoted from Sekitori, so let's say you fall the way down to, you fall the, all the way out of Jurio. So you've been, being, you've been getting paid good money, you've been able to maybe move out on your own, you've gotten married. You get demoted, you have to get permission to stay out. You have to get permission to not live with your spouse. You have to get permission to not move back into the Haya. Life is rough. And so this is one of the reasons why wrestlers want to stay in sumo for as long as they can. It's a very hard sport. There are not many people who are over the age of 35 in it. Older wrestlers fight tooth and nail to avoid relegation out of judo. And most commonly, also was with the case with Tochi Notion, once they, it's very clear that they're gonna be demoted, they almost always immediately retire because they have their life. They are living their life like a normal human being and they don't wanna go back to you know, the really hard world of, of being in the lower ranks. As I mentioned, outside of Yokozuna rank, there's no provision for injury. So through no fault of your own, you could get, uh, you could, I've seen shoulders get dislocated, we've seen concussions, we've seen all sorts of things. Too bad, so sad, unless you caught COVID, you're getting demoted, too bad. I didn't realize that rhymed, but damn. Pack it up. When retirement comes, sumo is a lifestyle and there are a few options for staying in the sumo world, but it's mainly for higher rank wrestlers. If you were a Sekitori and you fought at that rank for at least 30 tournaments, you actually will have a special retirement ceremony. So Hakuho, who retired several years ago at this point, just had his retirement ceremony. A part of the ceremonial thing is cutting off the top knot that they have on their head. People will pay up to $10,000 to pay to be one of many people who cut a small part of that hair off and they get to keep it. That's for the highest level people. And Hakuho is sort of a, he's a, he's a unicorn. There's, no, there's never really been anybody like him before or since. Um, and you could have an entire panel actually just about him. But for anybody who's at that level, they can use that as an opportunity to get as much money as they can, sell off some tickets, get a little bit of recognition and set themselves up for their next thing in their life. Some sumo wrestlers stick around as security. So if you ever walk, look around, or sometimes they'll have them on as speakers, at the back parts of sumo, uh, sumo tournaments, there are former wrestlers who are dressed up in a nice like polo shirt. They look like security and they are security. So like, there's not a whole lot of bad things that happen behind the scenes because you have people who are used to combat doing actual security. Other wrestlers get to become oyakata or they get to become stable masters. And you have to be an oyakata or a coach in order to become one of those referees that's actually by the side. So those, those folks can get paid. But for most people, they end up out of sumo with a battered body, serious health issues due to usually being obese, and no real job prospects. Very common, a lot of them end up working in kitchens because the food that they eat called uh, nabe, uh, nabeyaki, is very, is very popular in Japan, and so that's where some of them end up. For, for the rest, there's, there's no safety net. Life is hard. Sumo's future, so it really is a case of tradition versus modernization. Sumo is constantly battling internally, uh, very quietly, uh, but if you know where to look, you can find out some information about how they modernize things. One of the big things that they understand is they don't have a provision for injury. This causes a lot of problems and really is, for a sport that's so prone to have injuries, to not have something to protect people when they get injured is actually kind of a problem. There's lots of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. There are organizations of different heya, because they're basically everybody falls under a specific organization. And there's power struggles that take place behind the scenes, but it's one of the most forbidden things is to ever bring it up in the public. And past Yokozuna, who have been vocal about things, have ended up being forced to retire and surrender their elder stock or their partial ownership stakes in either a Heya or the Sumo Association itself because they brought it up. So interesting things. And as I mentioned, but I did mention there are some modernization things. I think at last year there was actually a very nasty concussion that happened in the middle of a match. And it was very clear that after the match, the, general, the, the wrestler who was concussed was 
basically stumbling around trying to finish the match. Nobody was doing anything. And it was all done on television. It was all very live. It's, it's the worst I've ever seen in, in you know, the 15 years I've, I've been watching. And so, as happens very often, but especially in sumo, because there was public outrage about something, there now is a protocol in place for somebody gets concussed. They're not allowed to stumble around. They're, for, they're basically held still until a wheelchair is brought out to, to wheel them back, and then somebody goes and takes a look at them. And I do say him because there are no female professional sumo wrestlers. Not, there are amateur professional uh, f uh, women in sumo, but not in anything to do with Japan because Japan is weird. We could go into that, but that's it's the stupidest fucking reasons I can possibly imagine. That's the only, I served, I saved my one F-bomb for that one, because <laughs> that one. I said it's a great time to be a sumo uh, fan. There's never been a better time, so there's actually a lot of stuff available. So how many of you have some form of cable, whether it's like Dish TV or some kind of you know Comcast or anything else? Nobody in here has cable? Okay, well, do you have bunny ears? Do you all stream everything? Well, guess what? There's an app for that, too. So NHK World, if you don't know about it, there's actually, so NHK is the official uh, channel in Japan, it's a TV channel. There's actually another channel that they do called NHK World, which does a lot of stuff in English. You can go to their website, and they have recently, for the last several years now, they actually have replays of sumo stuff, and they actually have what they call Grand Sumo Highlights. At the start of each day, so depending upon if you're watching it through the web or through an app or something else, it may be two or three days removed, but you can actually watch a half hour recap of the previous day's you know, top matches. You can watch it, it has English commentary. They also have a thing that they call um, Sumo Encyclopedia, and I'll show that a little bit later. But they also do Grand Sumo Live, so two days out of the tournament on NHK World, they'll actually show the two hours that takes place at the top of the of a, of the um, everybody in Makushita and up. So most of the like everything, all of Sekitori except for Judio. They'll show all of it. You can watch it live now. Right now, because of the way the time zones are lined up, Sumo starts at midnight here, so it runs from midnight till two a.m. So if you're a night bird, you can actually watch it. The expensive way, the way I used to watch it before these other options became available, is you can actually sign up for TV Japan if you have like a traditional cable carrier, but it's expensive. It's twenty-five dollars a month. It's the most expensive. Um, premium channel offering you can get from pretty much any service. I don't know why it's still so expensive, but what are you going to do? You can actually use a TV service called Ameba TV. You have to have a VPN to do it because it is geolocked. And me telling you you can use a VPN is not illegal because there's nothing illegal about VPN. You can also watch very recently, there is Sumo Primetime on YouTube. So this is actually a new channel that came about towards the end of last year through one of the former NHK English commentators, I can't remember his last, I can't remember his name, I think Hiro Yuki or Hiro or something like that. He actually was approached by the Sumo Association, now he puts out shows and episodes on his YouTube channel so you can learn more about Sumo because they're trying to slowly drive more non-Japanese audience growth. And then there are various streaming services, like perhaps a streaming service that does a lot of gaming stuff that rhymes with bitch. Um, nah, Twitch. There are plenty of people who restream stuff on Twitch. It's actually one of the ways I most commonly watch it. They'll, they'll show it live. I'm not gonna give specific recommendations, but I presume all of you know how to use Google. Um, or Bing, even Bing will find this for you. DuckDuckGo, I think Ask Jeeves is still around, so even that will find it for you. But you can actually watch it on, on Twitch, and I do kind of recommend that because you can actually ask questions in the chat. Some of the channels are more welcoming of newbies than others. If one channel doesn't work out, either just hide the chat or go someplace else. The nice thing about most of those streams on Twitch is they will actually have, they actually, most of them use Ameba themselves. And Ameba is unique in that NHK only shows two hours. They only show the top division. Ameba shows everything from the, when the day starts. So it's like nine hours of sumo of sumo. You can watch what it looks like for the people who are in the lowest possible divisions. There's nobody in the audience, or maybe one or two people in the audience, because they're just there fighting for their lives. So that those are all great ways for you to go and watch sumo. You can learn more. Sumo NHK World actually released several years ago a Sumopedia, which is like a collection of maybe 40 or 50 videos of like two or three minute clips that explains a particular topic. 
So they'll talk about what do the different, like there's a thing that's overhanging over all of the dohyo, and there's four little multicolored posts on each end. Those all have a religious significance. Or it'll talk about what do the yobidashi do. It'll talk about the role of salt and how they handle all of the salt. It'll talk about a particular technique or other particular wrestlers. Lots of really interesting stuff. And it's all available on the website to watch right now. You can just go and stream it whenever you want on demand. I frequent the Sumo subreddit. It's a good place to go. You can connect with other people. You can ask questions. You can search in there. Some of the videos you'll find here come from those Reddit channels or certain specific topics um, because it has good stuff. If you're curious about statistics, there's actually a website maintained by a nice gentleman in Germany called SumoDB. You can look up and find out statistics on all sorts of things. It's literally a Sumo database that you can query for all sorts of useful information. YouTube channels come and go. They just come and go because the NHK is schizophrenic and sometimes <laughs> likes them and sometimes demands that they be taken down. There are good uh, Twitter. There are good um, Twitter accounts to follow. You can follow. If you search for Sumo, you can find Sumo News. And then Tachii.org is a good blog you can follow for uh, all sorts of stuff. So we have about five minutes for Q&A, but I'll give a little info about myself. My name is Andre. You can find me on basically anywhere uh, as uh, Andre VS World. This is also on Twitch, which it's being streamed right now to all like three people, but it's mainly so that I have a recording of this. I have other events going on here. So tomorrow I have Cthulhu for President running from 12 to 1. I have Bad Hentai running from 8 to 10. I host Midnight Madness, which will be streamed. Cthulhu, I'm also going to try to stream. Um, Midnight Madness is over at the Sil over at Silver Island at the DoubleTree, um, and then the Hentai Music Videos contest as well. If you look on the Fanime Con website for under panel listings and you search for my name Andre, you'll find all of my stuff under there.